we spend dollars. So hopefully that's helpful. Very, yeah. It changes the mix of you know classic earned, owned, and and uh, and paid uh, media for sure. Um, Afi, how, how does uh, you know in a uh, do, do, with your DSP, are you are you uh, challenged by uh, using identity and being able to find the same person across the ecosystem? What are the data sources and providers like for you? Because there are, you know, we've worked with five different clients that have location data and are constantly trying to feed in as much detail and, hey, someone is, you know, in this specific geofenced area. Is that something you're doing more of and see a future? And are, are you getting response to that? Or is the creep factor you're sensing from audiences you know, turning people off to that kind of hyper-targeting. Um, so so uh, being able to identify a particular user in a location is, is critical for us. Hyperlocal is all around analyzing huge amount of ad requests and finding the 1,000 people that within half a mile from a store or one within 50 meters from a store, depends on your resolution. But there's, of course, a trade-off. The more accurate you are, the less traffic you will have, and prices go up. But the math works. So uh, when we see um, even branding campaigns in the US today start to split budgets between national campaigns and local campaigns. So local can be campaign, for example, running a campaign for car dealership in Atlanta that actually targets all the people that have visited two car dealerships in the last week, assuming that they're on the market buying a car. So you target based on the behavior as it is reflected by the GPS location of your phone. And, and the good thing for, for us is that 99% of the people here, GPS is always on. And if you have an Android, it also pings us all the time and we get more and more ad requests. So we actually have many data points that allow us to pinpoint and create a very good profile about you as a person based on your GPS location. So if I'm seeing you during the night in a particular location, probably you'll probably live there. And if you're in a, during the day, many times in a particular location, you probably work there. Connect this data to census data that is publicly available, and I know your income level of the, of, of the household. So GPS data or uh, ability to identify a person throughout the entire RTB ecosystem is something which is critical to our business. Having said that, it's only also very, very expensive. So for example, we don't know exactly which exchange or SSP you are coming from because you have dozens of applications or websites. So we need to basically analyze everything to only to find the 100 impressions that fit your very small local uh, um, targeting. We need to analyze half a million transactions per second. So on the one hand, we do see um, a shift towards hyper-local more accurate. On the other hand, it, it costs a lot of money to do it. Do you see that supply ecosystem, a, a pretty big trend uh, is around supply path optimization. A lot of DSPs and a lot of buyers are trying to figure out where the, the video supply specifically came from. Are you saying there's some confusion around which impression actually originated uh, the, act the actual ping? And it's, you know, a little bit of a Plinko game uh, where, you know, it's, it's tough to find the daisy chain of, of where the origination came yeah. from and it's tough to unpack? That actually comes to one of my... 10 predictions, uh, it will take me only 20 minutes to go over, but one of the things we do see uh, people talk more and more is about uh, bluff chain, uh, sorry, blockchain, um, and how it impacts advertising, because the ability to track um, the user and they, to know exactly where the impressions come from, that's actually what blockchain does. The thing is that implementing blockchain technologies in the ad tech space and I guess uh, Spotins will be very happy with that, will cost you huge amounts of resources calculating the ledger every time an impression has occurred. So we do see more and more uh, requests to see the origination of, uh, of the um, impression. Ads.txt is one example that tries to do that. But on a more broader approach, I think blockchain will get there and do that. It just will take a few more years because the compute resources will be very expensive. Yeah. Michal, let's talk about the current state and, and future of viewability. I know an important uh, topic for you guys. I mean, you know, we, we've done a lot of work with the IAB in four countries, and, and uh, the MRC has, you know, spent years getting these first set of standards together in, in desktop, then mobile, yeah. and, now, and now video. And, and just like every single standard, you know, you spend two years getting it together, and then immediately either Group M or other uh, folks want to say, we can do better. Or, you know, ad networks will say, we'll guarantee 100% viewability. Um, have, how, how have you thought we've, we've done as an ecosystem? Are we, are we valuing viewability? 
as a metric appropriately? Do you think we're going a little too far? Do you think viewability is going to matter as much down the road, or is it just complete table stakes where it's not even a KPI anymore? It's just going to be the default way we're calculating viewable CPM going forward. So we actually treat uh, the way we call it in our company is um, moving away from the crap.com uh, inventory. Yeah. Uh, what, what was that domain again? What is it? What was the domain? Crap.com? Crap.com. Very good. Uh, take note. <laughs> I don't know how many viewable ads they have. Okay. Uh, and for us, it's totally aligned with how we see it. Uh, we transact, we are video, but uh, as we actually uh, provide one-to-one -one messaging, uh, we moved away from the traditional brand metrics into more performance-related uh, metrics, and we um, measured by our customers uh, by our return on ad spend, CPA, um, and basically the move away from the crap.com, ensuring great viability, brand safety, removing fraud, is something that aligned with uh, where we want to go. Uh, we're working today with the top video advertiser in the United States, we have AT&T, Williams-Sonoma, Staples, Home Depot, Victoria's Secret. For everyone, that's one of the main things uh, they're requesting. They're adding it now to their uh, measurement. Um, I think eventually where this sh measurement should get in is within the attribution systems, uh, so that it will actually provide end-to-end -end view of how the per campaign performs. Uh, specifically about viewability, if uh, that's actual predict um, a, a premium experience or not, that's something that you refer to as well. I think it's a good start. Uh, I did hear a nice uh, story about it. Uh, Facebook actually did a test about viewability. Viewability is uh, for two seconds having the video, 50% of the video being above the fold. So basically, they took TV and performed the test uh, for TV and measured the viewability. And? 40% uh, viewability. <laughs> On linear TV? Linear TV. But wait, it's, I mean... Apparently, it's difficult. They put like, this device on the head of the testers, and apparently, it's difficult to watch for two seconds uh, a specific point, and you actually move your head, and you don't really... Are there, uh, your eyes are not really there for, for two seconds. But huh. basic, so, so you know, it's it's it just uh, a nice thing to say. The measurement is only an indicator. I like the trend. I think the trend is important. We definitely need to clean a lot of the inventory currently in the industry. We want to provide real, true performance to the publishers. It's interesting because uh, the television broadcasters and, and and sellers around the world will talk about how TV obviously is 100% viewable. By definition, for those of you who don't know, the, the, the standard is based on the opportunity to be seen. Not necessarily whether it is seen or not, but whether it comes on the screen. And obviously, well, of course, every commercial comes on the screen. It's full view, and you have the opportunity to see it. It sounds like there might be a difference, though, from actual uh, seen from there. Nice, yeah. Yeah, viewability, first we need to understand what viewability is. And there's two kinds of viewability. One is statistical viewability, like IAS does or Moat. Right. And the second one is a real-time viewability with something like RealView does. Um, so I believe that viewability is mostly important for branding campaigns. Because there's, if you're running programmatic and algorithmic and, and try to, to address every campaign as performance campaign, then you will find a math that actually works on non-viewable impressions. Because the CPM is very low. And the math works. And we managed to prove it in, throughout uh, many campaigns. We actually have a corporation with a company called RealView, which I spoke, which does a real-time viewability. And we have an SSP that is 100% viewable. Only viewable traffic that comes to, to which we analyze and, and understand that it's viewable in real time, only that uh, comes to that SSP. But we managed to show to campaigns that running um, a sort of performance campaign, and in my mind, every campaign is a performance campaign. Even if it's a video, the, you have to see the video starts playing. So we managed to show that there's math both ways. If you want to run a very cheap, uh, low CPM campaigns multiplied by many more impressions, you will get the performance that you eventually want. 
on, 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 if you want to pay more on a viewable uh, supply, then you need maybe less impressions, but the CPM is much higher. So there's, there's math works all the ways. But I think that the idea is not to assume anything again. Let the machine do its stuff and, and find the right patterns that fit your campaign. Just, your I would yeah. like to add something. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually totally agree. And therefore, what I think is that uh, because we do want to ensure that the, v v that the ads are viewed, and we do want to confirm that we do impact on the user. And the uh, solution will be that the attribution system will incorporate the, uh, the viewability uh, signal, uh, whatever that will be, but we, we need such a signal. And eventually, the performance of the campaign uh, will also for viewability. I wanted to ask about your soundbite that uh, all campaigns are performance-based and direct response. We may have a couple folks who are, are not maybe aligned directly on that for everything. Are, is that true for all of your clients? And then curious of, with Alex, of course. Can you repeat the question? Uh, Rafi's statement that all campaigns are performance-based, and certainly everything mm -hmm. can be measured, but just curious about the, the clients that are using your services, and then Alex, how you kind of, you know, uh, judge uh, effectiveness of campaigns and your ROI, please. I think, uh, first of all, I want to touch upon the viewability. I think that it's definitely something that is, you know, super important and becoming more and more important. I think, uh, as we said uh, in the last panel, there was a growth of 40%, uh, I think, in ad spending through video, and, but 98% of this growth was in Google and Facebook. So it's good that we are talking here, and in the end, they are the one that sets the rules here. And I think that uh, it's definitely with ATXT and other stuff that is coming, uh, viewability becomes more and more important. And viewability is, is basically an effort for performance, like you said before. Um, I, we can say, at least from our point of view, working with our uh, customers, uh, which are publishers, but also starting to work with brands, uh, they definitely look at the ROI that they are getting. And the ROI is uh, specifically on social networks is engagement. So they want to see a user engage with their content. Uh, again, we are a content creation platform. So the way they measure their success is how much effort they put in creating this content and what is the ROI they get from that specific content they are creating. Um, so that's, that is being measured by the engagement in the end. So Alex, I want to ask, so my first job, uh out of school, 25 years ago, I'm at Turner Broadcasting, a uh, US broadcaster with CNN and, and other entertainment brands. And uh, I was 20 years old, and, and uh, my job uh, was to move spots around with the TV shows. And then on a Friday, at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, a couple hours before the end of the week, if we ever had any spots left over that were not sold to Nestle or to Honda or large brands, then they would let the kid call up all of these direct response agencies, and I would, you know, have Craftmatic adjustable beds actually in, in your old vertical, and you know, every single, you know, uh, dial, dial for dollars and direct response advertising that is usually reserved for late night or unsold inventory, and that was performance-based video at the time, and it was kind of looked at, and still is in some ways in the TV world as kind of this. Eh, if you need to get more than zero dollars, then okay, you go after that. But to, to Rafi's point, I mean, you know, video has the perception of, well, it's sight, sound, and motion, and this is brand awareness that we use for that, and then we'll use other tactics like display or, or in-app or what have you to get a conversion. Do you look at it that separately, or is everything meant to be to a conversion? Sure, so, so I'll agree with, with, with what was said earlier that you know, when I spend a dollar, I expect it to bring some sort of return. As a CMO, I'm presented with opportunities to do brand building stuff all the time versus campaign-oriented conversion, direct response sort of work. And, and just for some context, Purple didn't exist two years ago, received no investment, and, and now we have a billion dollar valuation. And that's been due to scaling our dollars that converted in, in a rapid way rather than spending millions of dollars on brand building campaigns that might work, right? So um, things that were measurable and, um, you know, the, the thing that really stands out for me is that I, I want things to be unique. You know, most companies look at best practices, they go read a blog post and they say, hey, the, these are the 10 things that everybody does. You know, I've heard a lot of people talk about six second videos and I'll, I'll agree, but if, if you spend a minute to look at Purple's YouTube channel or our Facebook page, our highest viewed videos are four minutes. 
So we're trying to do things that are unique and memorable. We might treat the first six seconds like a traditional six second video, but if uh, someone is engaged, they find value in the content that we're presenting and they're entertained, even if they don't care about mattresses, like most people don't think about them every day, um, you know, we do try to entertain and we'll find our view through rate on those four minute videos, not view through, but the average view is two minutes. And for somebody that expects just to watch a couple second video, the fact that they're spending two, mon two minutes on our content um, is valuable to me and it helps that brand stick in, in, in their mind. So yes, I, I believe in conversion oriented um, advertising rather than just throwing my dollars at brand building. Yeah. Well, yeah, I want to argue for different metrics, not viability, but hearability. And the fact that audio is very underrated in, uh, in, in the, even in the video space, many people pay a lot of attention to the visual side of the ad, but less to the audio side of the ad. And, and in my mind, you can, it's much more difficult to block in your mind the, the soundtrack of the video than the visual of the video. Because you, you may turn away from the TV or from the screen, but you still hear the, the, the audio. Right. And we see today a rise in audio, actually, uh, programmatic audio. And, and so I think when even if we speak here, you, you, you caught a bite that interests you and said, okay, let's, let's expand on that. And that's something that happens a lot on audio. You hear something which is interesting, and then you turn back to the computer and see, or to the phone or whatever, uh, and then you pay attention to the ad. So I would actually argue that hearability is as important, if not more, than viewability, because it can drive viewability. But Facebook uh, currently plays it in mute, so. That's their problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a couple more topics before we get to predictions at the end here. Um, a couple of trends around the future. Usually, uh, when there's new technology, uh, there are fewer companies that have control of it and do it in a managed service way, and then eventually that technology gets pushed out to others. And uh, the same trend happens with large companies that, hey, only the largest brands, only the largest agencies, largest tech companies can use this new technology, and then smaller businesses kind of play catch up. I'm, I'm curious, Joe Tom, about how you see the, the evolution of, of services and, yeah. and DSP usage pushing down to, you know, the, at the local level. I mean, it was great having Lee here from the, the, uh, the uh, auto dealership talking about how, you know, at each of their dealers, uh, they're starting to use this technology. Are you seeing that as well, or is there still a price issue or other challenges getting these tools in the hands of uh, yeah. um, everyone? So, so I think in general, uh, what we see as a big trend, at least from our perspective, is that brands in general become storytellers as well. So if up until today they were producing only promotional videos and trying to scale this, they are starting to understand that there is a lot of engagement they can create in storytelling for video. And what we were surprised, again, we, we started with approaching publishers, which are the biggest storytellers, but we saw that a lot of brands and different type of companies came to Webits to scale video production and to tell more stories, like for example, universities. We work today with Harvard University. They produce about 10 videos a, a month just for our platform because it's easy, efficient, and they want to tell stories on social. Uh, we work today with authors. They want to promote their book, which is kind of like an SMB, and a different type of customers that we didn't think that would fit our platform in the beginning. Uh, but we understand that they are becoming more and more aware of this technology and their ability to actually produce good and quality videos in an efficient way. And I think this trend will grow in 2018, and we'll see more and more companies, brands, uh, agencies starting to create uh, content and storytelling videos and not just promotional and ads. Um, so this is definitely something that I see growing. At least we are seeing that as a large percentage of our customers today that we didn't have in mind before. No, fair. Yeah. Um, I think that um, video today is to, extend, to an extent capped because, like you said, large brands use video and it's a great tool. Uh, I think the next phase and the next evolution will be basically giving small businesses or local businesses the ability to use video as a significant advertising uh, tool to their businesses. Because think about it, you have today, uh, the production cost of video for brands is substantial. It's not zero, it, it does cost money. Um, but for small business, if I have to pay 100 bucks to produce a very simplest video on Fiverr or something like that, that's still a substantial portion from my campaign budget. So, so what we are trying to, to build and, and see that basically you have a great creation tool, it's your mobile phone. 
Why don't take a 15 second video of your pizza place with the latest offering, upload it uh, with your location known from your GPS, and immediately you, you can run a campaign on video promoting your business hyperlocally. So that's something we're actually building today. We'll see it coming uh, live very shortly, is an app. App that you can take a 15 second video of your business, add two lines of caption to the video, and, and voila, you have a ca video campaign with audio, with everything that goes live in hyper locally to your business. And that's, I believe, the next evolution of video because video is, the fact that video is used mostly by brands means that we have not reached the maximum potential of, of this kind of, of medium. And, and that's what we want to see in the next year or two. Cool. Uh, one more question before we get to predictions. I know we've only got a couple minutes left. When I ask, uh, we touched a little bit on measurement. I want to ask about the future of measurement. Uh, in the U.S. and in other places, there's kind of one dominant company that's been uh, known around television measurement, and there are some major challenges and pushes uh, to try and do better than their survey-based data around television. Uh, Facebook, uh, as we know, has been dinged uh, and had their hands slapped uh, in, the, in the press, maybe not so much with dollars, more than 12 times by admitting measurement mistakes that they've made, uh, where they've had challenges in, in having accurate uh, representation of, of their own measurement. Do you see, uh, I mean, we work with the DPAA, which is this trade group that works in the out-of-home industry and is trying to uh, justify and, and put more video on screens and say, hey, uh, you should be able to measure us the same way that we measure the impact on a television screen or on this phone. H how do each of you take a look at uh, measurement and trying to get to, an equal, are we going to get to one standard uh, where a view is a view, an impression is an impression, and an action is an action, whether it's on a great billboard out here uh, in the square or on this phone here? Or is it, hey, we just need to deal with the ecosystem the way it is, and we'd rather have many players give us their own data sources that we can evaluate independently? Start with that. I really wish it was going to be simple enough to say a view is a view across all platforms, but it's so interesting how each company tracks things differently. Facebook, you know, within seconds they're counting it as a view, and in YouTube it's it's a little bit different, and they each count that view differently. Uh, for us, you know, being so e-commerce centric, um, I have to de depend on as many attribution models as I can. You know, still so many brands depend just on last click. We're yeah, you're not last click, last yeah, view. Please. Yeah, yeah we're, that's why we're, you're here. We're trying to leading. God you know, bless you. Yeah, we're we're relying on three different uh, attribution models. They're all algorithmic, and you know, if I was to give just last click uh, measurement, the the dollars, everything would go to Google because people learn about us, then they go search and, and then they type in a text box. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, but yeah, I, I wish it was going to be simple. I feel like it's going to be years before it gets there. Hopefully somebody else has more insight. I'm not a technology uh, player, but hopefully these guys are going to fix it sooner so that it can be one, one view. So I'm depending on you guys. What do you think? How are we? Are we, are we getting there? So I think the main challenge, and you actually touched it, is with the walled gardens. Uh, the world is going into more and more walled gardens. We have now Facebook and uh, YouTube, which roll over 60% of the video advertising. Uh, we're going to see additional uh, smaller World Garden, Pinterest, uh, Amazon, Snapchat, uh, for which you can't really do advanced attribution easily. Um, so, you know, it's future yeah. to tell, but that's the challenge. It's the yeah. World Garden. Um, I, I would actually argue differently a bit. Again, because we see the world, I, I believe strong believe in performance. Really, I, I don't think that any branding campaign is really worth the investment. If you don't have a way to measure how effective the campaign was, just going in the street and, sh uh, fl and sending flyers around, and whoever ever catches, catches. So I'm a big, uh, I want to see everything performance-wise. So if, if I'm treating everything performance, I don't care about the cost of the impression. I care about the value of impression. And that may bring us to a different metric because the value of impression could be same if the, it costs $1 CPM on a mobile phone on $10 on, on a TV. But the value of the impression, and again, it's, everything is math. Nothing is, is feelings or gut feeling or nothing like that. If the math, math works, then you can calculate the value of each and every impression. And, and also addressing the thing that we said about TV, which is very interesting. I think that we're seeing today TV becoming more personalized. TV moves from the living room, from the living room to the actual personal rooms. So if you take OTT TV, which is IP-based, I can actually create a different profile for my son 
He's 16 years old, watches NBA all the time, and that's his profile. Or my daughter, which is uh, watched, I don't know, uh, sorry for that. But she's 15 and she watches her shows, but that's a completely different profile. And if I can customize the ads on the TV, on the OTT TV, because everything is digital over IP, that means I can personalize and bring TV closer to uh, digital. And that's, I think that's also something that we'll see in the next couple Good. of years. All right, we've got less than a minute left. Uh, prediction time. Uh, this is where we put the pressure on you and create a little controversy, a little news, a little discussion for, uh, for our break coming up. One sentence predicting, if we're on stage here in two years, what's different in two years around video? In the future, it could be about measurement, it could be about the walled gardens, it could be about your own businesses. And don't say, oh, we're going to be number one in our category. You're not allowed to say that. Everybody, we'll knows, be number one. everybody knows that's going to happen. <laughs> if you already are, then that's fine. Exactly. So you don't need to worry about saying that. Give me something two years from now that is completely different around video than today. I, I think right now people think about testing with the advertising dollars and the optimization and filtering and all, all of those things. I think there will be drastically more testing with the creative. Uh, if you look at our assets, um, you know, we have 35 videos on our, on our YouTube cha channel, for example. In these two years, we've had a billion views across Facebook and YouTube. And each one of those 40 or so videos has hundreds of variations that we tested with just 100 bucks, and we see the difference in engagement. So, nice. Dynamic yeah. creative optimization. Much more at scale in video. Yotam? I'll say two things. First of all, I think Amazon will become a big player in the video space, yeah. uh, competing with Google and Facebook. And the second thing is I, I see a world where companies, brands, SMBs produce much more uh, videos that are storytelling and less promotional. Good. Michal? True one-to-one -one video messaging, uh, meaning millions of video advertising out there. Uh, measured by performance, uh, wrapped as an end-to-end -end engine with advanced AI to manage all that mass in terms of targeting message to the right person, the right time, the right message. Rafi, ads, ads suck less in two years, right? No problem. Well, that's for sure. That's but one. Actually, right. I agree with Alex to, to an extent that we'll see uh, large campaigns splitting into smaller campaigns with much more measurable testing and optimization for each every small campaign. Because if you have 100 different creatives, they're not the same. Everyone will be de behave a bit differently. And the only way to do it effectively with uh, automation. You cannot have uh, people sitting with Excel sheets uh, changing. If it's not programmatic, it's not algorithmic, it doesn't work. So that's one. And secondly, um, small businesses. I would believe that small businesses will begin to use more and more uh, video as it becomes easier to produce the ad. Great, thank you. Uh, we, uh, I, I was worried when Ariel first invited uh, me to participate that the entire conference would be in, in Hebrew, so I was you know, getting my apps and starting to learn very quickly six months ago. Uh, it's great to know that uh, all of your English is incredibly better than uh, my Hebrew. Um, with that, uh, we've got a break coming up, so uh, uh, Michal and I will work on getting company t-shirts so you can find us as easily as these uh, three companies here. Uh, but uh, please join me in saying toda and shalom to Alex, uh, Yotam, Michal, and Rafi. Thank you.